secret. You can always write that note to me and you can rest assured that I won't grade it down. Also, you can put it right on your post that you had. Just don't spend a lot of words describing it. Um, just on your post, you can say the explanation is in the, the bigger post. And that's it. I think it should be pretty smooth. One less thing for you to worry about is what I'm trying to do. Um, let's see, I don't always succeed when I try to do that. Um, but we shall see. All right, so let me, let me call roll here and see if I've got, now Amina is here, right? Uh, yes, Professor. Okay, so an Anmin Dong dropped. Okay, I've got that one for sure. Arifa Sanjar, I think has dropped. It's just the list she sent me, the list that's there now is not the same as I expected. So Bristi is here. Fahima, yes, professor. Yeah, Fahima Sultani. Is Fahima Sultani here? Okay. I think she's gone. Okay, Fatima is here. Um, yes, Habib, professor. Habiba is here. Hafsa. Hafsa, are you here? Hafsa Akhtar. Nope. Um, Janifa. Yes, there she is. Okay. Jacinta is here. Nisali is here. Yes, Professor. Good. Um, Kaula. Kaula Khalid Ahmed. Yes, Professor. What should I call you? <laughs> Kaula. Kaula. Just the first name. All right. Sometimes when they have four names, like it's like with Nisali, it's name number three. <laughs> yes, um, my name is five. Okay. That's only four. Yeah. Uh, Mahira. Present, Professor. Marika. Yes, Professor. Maruka Husani. Okay, I think she's out. Marisa is here. Right. Marzia, Professor? Yeah, Mar Marzia, sorry. Uh, yes. Dolana is here. Yes, Professor, I'm here. Trin, is that correct? Yes, sir. Pooja. Oh, where's Pooja? What did, um, Rahima. Toma. Rahima Akter Eva. Okay. Sauda. Okay. Sauda Akter. Yeah. There. No, and I have Sadia Islam. Yep. And yes, Rafa, Rafa is here, right? Rafa, yep, and uh, Rash, Rashani. Present professor. Yes, so the three of you, the last three are not on the list, but I'm, I wanted to take attendance today before I go and try to clear things up because there's just a lot of names that- Hello, professor. Oh, we're on that list. Oh, Taslima is here. Now, what about Thank Sada? You. Sorry, Taslima. Sada Akhtar Momo, is she here? Okay. All right, I'll just put those as absent. Um, all right. So the things we're going to do today, we have the paper that I asked you to read, Philosophy, Feminism, and the Development of International Culture. So what I'm going to do is go to where I posted the outline. Now, hopefully you already have three points 
from the reading that you want to discuss in your group. That's, that's my goal because the most important thing is for you to understand your own mind and how you process things, what things stand out to you. You can tell by my paper, right? That philosophy stands out to me. Like not very many people would write this paper because they wouldn't think about the power of ideas, right? So, so that's my way of just showing you that each person filters life in a different way. And that's perfectly fine. That's how we find out what we should really do professionally with our lives. Um, so the reason why I picked what we've got today is because last time we were talking about Athena, I mean, Apollo, I'm sorry, the god of science, math, uh, STEM, and so just those reasoning powers, right? And, uh, okay, so Mahira, yes? Uh, Ma'am, uh, before we go to breakout rooms to discuss what stand out to us, can you uh, please explain this reading uh, uh, more? That's little? what I'm going to go over the outline, right? So yeah, I am going to do that. Um, let's see. So where was I? You, you're, um, so the first thing would be that you would find what, what sticks out to you. Um, the reason I have this is because last time we were doing the reasoning powers. And so Mary Wollstonecraft, that was her main thing. You've got to educate women. You have to make them aware that they have reasoning powers. So you can think about if you, if you know of classmates in school or relatives or other people in your society, women who never were given the chance to awaken to their own power of reason, right? All they do is defer to men. So they have the capacity, but they're not using it. And it's really hard to communicate, right? To tell someone, you can think for yourself, right? Um, but I do want this class to be about you thinking for yourself. Um, so anyway, the first part of the class, I'll go over that outline. If you've already come with some things to say, that's great. You can add, there might be something you didn't notice or something more you wanna say. Those of you who didn't come with something can start writing some things because you'll have to put that in your post. Then I'll put you into groups, okay? That's the first part of the class. So stay on task. You have to promise me in your groups, you will stay on task. And then you will pick someone to be the monitor, to call on people, right? And nobody, everyone needs to talk. Um, and then to report back in at the, when we get together. So that's round one. Then I have an outline by John Stuart Mill, an outline of his book. It's a very, very long explanation for why women should be treated equally. And he made that explanation at a time when it just seemed obvious to men and a lot of women that women aren't interested in politics. Women don't think like that, right? So he's trying to use the tools of Apollonian reasoning. That's what's really interesting. He's using the tools of Ap Apollo kind of reasoning to argue for this extremely radical change, the most radical change, right, in human history. More than half the people in a society have to get treated completely differently, right? And so he's trying to use you know, the scientific method generally starts with what's already happened or what's happening, right? That's how you, you anticipate something. And so uh, you predict, you hypothesize. And given that that's all he had to work with, it's pretty ingenious. So that'll be the second part of the class is that I'll go over it 
but I want each of you, while I'm going over it, to pick your favorite three things. Then you go into groups, you talk about that. Then the third part, I asked you to go find an organization today, an NGO, something in your government, something locally that you know about, something that the focus of the organization is the education of women. <laughs> you can't count AUW, although it definitely is. But um, all right, so we have three rounds and then you go into groups again. Any questions on that? That's gonna be our process today. All right, so let's go. Um, here is the outline. All right. Oops. So here's the United Nations capabilities model for development. And um, all of you, I think, should be familiar with it because all of you live in countries that are um, that engage with the UN or the UN engages with you, you know? There's a lot of involvement there. And you can think about, do you think this is a good model? And later on in the class, we're gonna have a discussion of that model. We're gonna have women who've written about Martha Nussbaum and the capabilities model. So this is a continuing conversation uh, for people who are at the UN. This is something they refer to that might be the main thing they refer to. But anyway, I think you ought to know it. I also think it's interesting Philosophy, politics, and economics are inseparable, and that's why AUW has a PPE. <laughs> I didn't write this because of that. I wrote this long before I ever taught at AUW, but the paper shows that, right? So these are capabilities, right? Um, and a just society is one where the leaders use the resources they have to promote and develop the, as many capabilities of as many of their citizens as they can, okay? All of that is important because some uh, leaders have more resources per person than others. So you can't blame the Bangladesh leaders because not every Bangladeshi has you know a three bedroom apartment and air conditioning and heating you know I mean there's just there's not enough resources right so but the UN does evaluate each country and each country's the justice or injustice of their leaders according to their assessment of whether they are organized in a way to promote, to cultivate, to nurture, maximize the capabilities of the most people. So that's where we're at. Um, bodily health, bodily integrity, and then beyond that, using your senses and thinking in a way that isn't just tied to desperate survival needs, right? And so you get an education. So here we are. We're already at education, being able to use your mind, uh, freedom of expression, right? Freedom of religious exercise, emotions, being able to have attachments uh, to people and things, right? Not being separated from your loved ones. Um, okay, and practical reason is the main one that I focus on, being able to form a conception of the good because that's the one that forms how you use your reasoning, right? And whether you get educated or not. So being able to affiliate with other people, uh, justice friendship, this is uh, freedom of association, uh, not being humiliated, not being discriminated against, uh, being able to live in relation to other animals, the natural world, so that being an environmentalist, and the UN is very much into environmental protection, boy. They're, they gather together uh, 
the most respected group of scientists to send in their reports, which the most recent one was really bad. Um, being able to laugh and play, control over your environment, political participation, and then economics. Um, now, the thing about this that you really need to take note of is that the very last part of the last point has to do with economics. And women do need to be able to have property rights and to get jobs and to collect money, you know, to accumulate money and property. But in our globalized economy, it, the values tend to be absolutely the reverse, right? You start out with the profit motive and everything else follows from that. But that's why the UN, you know, we need the UN to keep the priorities straight. Um, but anyway, so my paper is about that number six looks like it's, nobody has time for that, right? Everybody's trying to survive. That's too esoteric. That's just a bunch of intellectuals sitting in their offices with time on their hands, you know? <laughs> and so I'm trying to argue that, no, it's not. Um, because the UN has a conception of the good and that sustains everything they do. They hold themselves accountable for try doing what they can to cultivate uh, capabilities. Um, when rulers believe that women or members of a race are incapable of the highest levels, they deny or limit their ability to exercise all the other capabilities. So what I'm saying is that number six actually governs uh, a woman's experiences from the day she's born. And she doesn't necessarily know that. She doesn't know it's because privileged guys decided you didn't have the same capabilities that therefore, you're gonna not get as much food or you get the sh sugar in your tea and your brother gets the milk in his tea or something like that, right? Okay, Mahira? Ma'am, uh, this UN ca uh, capabilities model is about if women get education, then they will get freedom of speech and this, these things or uh, education is necessary to have this all. Right. Well, you start out that women are capable of it and then you provide it. But you know, you could have in Indonesia, they had a very authoritarian leader who really didn't allow for a lot of freedom of speech, but he was very pro development of women. So, <laughs> right? So it can get complicated. Um, but in theory, when you, when you educate women, they should be able to speak, right, in the political realm. But there are politicians who just want to educate people to be, um, because you can get, they can move up in terms of economic development, but they don't really want free speech. Um, does that make sense? That means, uh, um... Women have the capabilities to do all this if education is given, right? Yes, that's that's the idea. So the idea is that as long as women are denied education and they don't, they're told they're not as capable. They they won't develop these capabilities, right? Um, but and that's why it's wrong, right? You have to have this true concept of women they are, that's the truth. And if you have a just society, a just society is based on the truth. No matter how much change it takes, no matter how critical you are of the society you have, if it's based on a lie, right? If it's based on a false view of, of women or race or sexual orientation, you must, change, right? That's the idea. So this is her argument for um, that why women do have this intellectual ability. And the thing that's interesting is she starts with religion because in her day, and, and again, it's an open question for the rest of you. 
some of you, your religion was a major motivator for you to get your education. Some of you, you know that religion is a real hindrance in your uh, village, perhaps. And that's the reason why some of the AUW students, uh, their parents are criticized for sending their daughter. So religion is ambiguous, but she gives, I think, a really good argument. She says, you have to live virtuously to be saved, and you have to use your reason in order to have the self-control to be virtuous and to, you know, so it has to be a gift from God, right? Because God isn't going to create women and say, you can save yourself or damn yourself based on your self-control, but I'm not going to give you re reason to be able to control yourself. So here you go, women, you're all going to be damned because you're going to be self-indulgent. Too bad for you. <laughs> no, you know, that's not true. So she's arguing on the premises of religion that a man would accept and then concluding that therefore women must have reason because they have to have it to get saved. Um, so, I, I mean, you can decide if you think that's a good argument. It's, you know, based on concepts. Then what is reason? It's the power to generalize ideas and draw conclusions from facts, the power to transcend immediate experiences. So just in my class, I think in every class you're in, you're learning these underlying causes of the natural world, mathematics, patterns in math, the social world, the emotions, you're understanding patterns in people's emotions. You're just, you're always looking, you know, for something bigger than what's in front of your face. You're always looking for some more general trend or some concept like reason and how it applies. Um, and this would be the part of our souls, right? Like my sense of taste is not gonna live after I'm dead. But if anything survives after I'm dead, it's going to be my mind. Um, so again, your belief, you know, if you have religious belief, it should be reaffirming uh, the power of reason. But as a matter of fact, women are discriminated in education. And if you do that, you're denying them the moral responsibility for their actions you're condemning them to damnation. Um, if, they're, if they're believed to have a soul, then they must have reason. Um, all governments that deny women education are unjust. Um, men are given the opportunities to set goals and control themselves to reach the goals. Women are denied those opportunities, so they don't have any reason to control themselves. It starts in childhood. You can think about that. Do you think you started as a young, you started pretty young to set goals for yourself? Um, marriage, the marriages she's arguing are a lot better if women are educated and rational because they don't keep uh, falling into these sexual fantasies or wanting to keep the relationship like um, adolescent or youth level. They want to be um, become friends with their husbands over time. Um, they their modesty should be based on their use of their reason, like knowing what they know and don't know, and that's all. You know, you could be modest in the, as opposed to intellectually arrogant. Instead of using modesty as some kind of way to um, manipulate men. An impulsive mother is not gonna be a good mother. Um, political life and educated, you need women to be educated to think clearly about politics and to, if they can vote, to vote appropriately. They couldn't in Wollstonecraft's time. Uh, but also that uneducated women will push their husbands. They'll be ambitious for their husbands because they can't be ambitious for themselves. So their husbands might be pushed to do jobs they can't really do, or to vote in ways that are only personal interest rather than to care about the common good. So only educated women 
can think about citizenship and the common good and be good citizens. Um, they're less likely to be duped by religious charlatans, right, who are, who are manipulating them. Um, so why should we study such an old book? Wollstonecraft, you know, it's old. It's a couple centuries old. Well, it's good to see the patterns that keep repeating themselves. Every time a kid goes through puberty, we have to start all over, you know? They have to learn to self-control. You know, we keep having these same problems um, and we still have to, everybody has to, you know, control themselves with their reason um, and practical reason as at the root of, your ability to form your own character, and then oppression. If you deny people education, you deny them the ability to form their character, then you justify treating them as inferior. It's just a downward spiral. Um, there is the external environment is powerful, but it can it'll never make women naturally um, irrational. Women are naturally rational. Every time a little girl is born, she can figure it out. So um, the societies can try to silence her and oppress her, but eventually it's just, you just have to give up, it's a lie. Um, okay, so you can think about in your country, and then this is dated, this is a few uh, decades ago and it could easily be different. She was working in India. Um, she agrees with Wollstonecraft on all of these things, um, educating women, all that stuff, religious laws. Oh, in India, it just talks about religious laws and how they can lead to the denial of women's rights, but ultimately they shouldn't. She, she and Wollstonecraft both think that rational religion is best for promoting change um, in the broader populace. So there are plenty of feminists that hate religion, get it out of here, it's just a tool men use to oppress people, but it's not fair to religion and also it'll never wash. It'll just force a lot of women to reject feminism because it's too far, it's too radical, right? But if you unite reason and faith, there's a much larger group of women that would like to have a more developed life. Um, so religious toleration, religious freedom, uh, feminists don't have to be atheists, but they really have to avoid anti-intellectual religion. They have to avoid blind faith. Um, let's see, okay. So I would like you then to get into groups. I'm gonna break you up. Um, I hope, is everybody ready? Anybody have a question where they, okay. I And just pick a spokesperson. You can write notes while you're, all of this stuff can go into your post, you know, because you're writing a book to yourself about everything you're learning in the class. And then whether or not you want these things in your final paper, which is how can women make the world a better place? Um, Let's see, so, so 100 and, uh, 200 words is a minimum. So just, just go for whatever it is you want to tell yourself, remind yourself, teach yourself about the material of the day. Um, I'm gonna put you in two groups. Remember to have a um, spokesperson. Okay. If, is that too many, too few, is that too many people? I don't know, you have to let me know. It's about turning on the recording, that's what it's about, no. It's about the responsibility of intellectuals, right? So intellectuals are not supposed to be sitting in their offices talking to themselves. <laughs> But uh, John Stuart Mill, they're supposed to be providing a vision, right, based on their education, based on the study of history or the study of literature, the study of, um, you know, reading essays, reading, uh, getting informed about what's going on. They try to bring all this together 
and provide a vision forward that's reasonable, right? It's not a utopia, but it's not fear of the future or fear of change. So the intellectuals, people mostly are afraid of change and they like habit. So the intellectuals have to provide a vision that's going to convince people to look forward because to go backwards or even to stay where you are is um, degenerating because life keeps changing. So you have to keep changing with it. Um, okay, so Rafa has to leave because her electricity is 9%. I forgive you, Rafa. And um, I'll put it on the YouTube. I'll send you a copy. Um, hang in there. Just don't run out of juice inside of you. You can run out of juice outside of you. OK, so here comes John Stuart Mill. And um, the a thing that I really admire about him is that he takes scientific method and uses it to provide a reasonable vision forward, not kind of some kind of detached utopia. It's very concrete argument for this huge change, right? And this was in the 1800s. This was a long time ago. This was when, you know, if you ask people based on just their visual experience, not thinking about the underlying meaning of their experience, just what their experience is, they would never think you should treat women as equals. So this is just a good example of looking for those underlying realities and, and bringing them forward. So the argument, this is um, the argument that they, women should be treated as equals in every way, and it's a hindrance to human improvement, right? You're crippling people. History is moving forward, and it's the biggest hindrance uh, to not let women be involved. Why is it difficult to prove? Okay, so what I want you to do while I'm going through this list, again, pick out the ones that really stick out to you, right? And at least three in kind of the order, because then when you meet in a group, maybe all of you will agree that was my number one, and that will be sort of interesting. Or somebody will pick out something that hadn't even occurred to you, it wasn't important to you. But I think every answer is interesting because it shows how much, how differently we filter in our, you know, what we hear, what we learn. So what about the preponderance of feelings? What our feelings conflict with what's reasonable, the influence of social institutions, habit and custom and prejudice. People are unwilling or unable to re-examine their habits. So again, intellectuals should be at the forefront of having re-examined their own habits and then encouraging others to do so by giving reasons, you know, arguments. Um, the burden, this is, this is um, it is kind of funny because he's saying in everything else, men, you know, in the 1800s, they assume more and more freedom and more and more equality. This is the enlightenment. And you have to argue if you don't want everyone, every man <laughs> to get more freedom and equality, well, then how come that isn't true for women? How come people arguing for women have to make these huge arguments? Like why, why can't women just, yeah, they're part of it too. No, that's not the way it works. You have to prove it to me. Um, it's difficult to prove a negative. It's difficult to prove that everything we're doing is wrong, right? So you have to create this image forward. Um, there's this romantic view of instinct over thought. It's so sentimental. <laughs> and then naturalism, you know, the inequality of the sexes is natural. We don't know what's natural, right? As long as we oppress women, we have no idea what's natural. And then religion, right? In the name of God, you don't need evidence. You don't need, you know, you can pull in everything and call it God's will. 
So we really don't know, and he's looking forward to social science to help create a much better society. Why is it important to speak out? Male domination was never initiated after thought and experiment. So the scientific method, right, is that you have your control group and then you have your variable. So you're testing to see if this is going to be better or worse relative to the control group. And he says, we never had any experiments. There was no evidence. It was just might makes right, right? It was just this habit that evolved. Um, we don't have anything to compare it to. The origin was just men have more upper body strength and they don't need to take time out to, to deliver and nurture babies. So they just gave themselves the power to dominate. That's not a reason. Um, there wasn't any concern for justice. Uh, so somebody has to speak out. What about the argument, but women accept it, right? They like it that way. <laughs> he goes, no, not all of them do. <laughs> and then no oppressed class begins by asking for a complete change. What they talk about is how much your husband beats you as opposed to my husband beats me. Or, you know, if my husband treats the kids better than your husband, but they never question the oppression itself. All right. Um, and this is true for slavery also. People used to compare whose master was, was more violent than the other one and they didn't question the institution. Uh, women are afraid to complain, obviously. How are you gonna go publicly and say, my husband is a, is a, a rapist, you know, and then you have to go home and sleep with them. I mean, of course they're not gonna complain. Um, they're dependent on him economically. Uh, in no other case is a person uh, who's been proved to, to suffer an injury has to go right back under the power of the person that injured them. So all the causes make it unlikely that women should rebel. So it's amazing that they ever do, as a matter of fact. Um, also, it's internalized. Men don't want a forced slave, but a willing, you know, love sort of conquers all or People think because they love each other, they can put up with this other stuff. Um, the institutions try to enslave women's minds. Education teaches them that getting married is their goal. So you combine that with the natural attraction between the second sexes. And then when you have children, you're so economically and emotionally interdependent. And then men, women become dependent on men that that's really, how could anybody know what's natural? Um, in the past, people have always held false beliefs. Eventually the truth comes out. Someone has to be the messenger. Um, in ancient societies, people's identities were their social roles. In modern, we value individuality, freedom and equality. So women should be given a chance. Um, modern economics, uh, minimal government intervention, uh, free choice and competition. Women should be able to be part of this. Um, the importance of free and open discussion. Uh, experience can't be evidence because experience is very much controlled by social forces. Uh, social reform, um, ever, so far every improvement has been accompanied by more equality for women. No one knows the nature of the sexes based on the artificial way they're, they're put together. Their characters are distorted. Uh, we're ignorant about how human character forms. We need a science of the laws, of influence of circumstances. So that's what social science has been over the last couple hundred years. Um, very few men know the characters even of their wives and daughters because everybody's just playing a role. Um, let's see, very few people know themselves for all that, you know, but all these stereotypes about men and women are all based on socially constructed um, ways that, that are not natural is what he's saying. 
politics. Okay, here's a good argument, I think. If women are by nature intended to be wives and mothers, there's no need to force them to be. Just give them complete freedom and they'll be wives and mothers because that's natural, right? The truth is, you know, if women, women have to have babies, so if they're given any other choice, they won't. So we have to force them into it, right? And so the, you know, every time you force a woman to be a wife and mother, you're, you're implying that it's not natural. There's other things she might really want to do. Um, but if you do force them, you really need to have marriage criteria for responsible husbands, right? If they had other options, they would have to treat their wives responsibly because the women would have an option. But if you, um, if you really want to oppress them, don't even teach them to read, right? Don't teach them, don't educate them because they might get uppity. <laughs> okay, that given it's the only option of marriage, it should be pleasant. And that is not true. So even in the 1800s, uh, men had absolute power over their wives. Um, they didn't have any proper property rights. Um, they could force women sexually. There was no legal limits. Children are the property of men. If women leave, they can't take. They can't take anything. He can force her to come back. So these, you know, you can think about in your countries. I don't know what the laws are, and I don't know what the expectations are, like the social norms. It might be legal to do things that, if you do them you will be ostracized, you know. Um, women can't get a divorce if they're raped. Um, they can't tell anybody what's happening because their husbands will abuse them even more. So it's despotism, like it's absolute power in a society that's supposed to be moving toward democracy. Um, women can become passive aggressive, right? Because they're powerless. Um, uh, they, at best, they should actually like each other and they care about their kids. And that's nice. Uh, but sometimes the wives are ambitious for their husbands because they don't, they can't achieve their own ambitions. Um, women are idealized. Oh, she's so, she's so pure. She's so virtuous. She couldn't possibly deal in the dirty world of power and money, you know? <laughs> Anytime you sort of put a woman on a pedestal, you also sort of putting her away <laughs> and denying her of opportunities. Um, women are too self-abnegating and women are, men are too egotistical. They overrate their own capacities and virtues and women underrate them. Um, Family life should be based on equality. Now, he still, John Stuart Mill still thought women should choose between a career and a family. And that is still a major problem in every country, even in Europe. It's just a problem. Nobody has figured this out. Um, but let's see, there are a lot of people who have wonderful relationships, right? And they think, well, we don't really need to change the laws, but the laws are made for really nasty people <laughs> to prevent them from having the power to do stuff. Um, so you have to think about what good marriage laws should be because laws are about policies that apply to everyone. You can't just think about yourself. Um, Philosophy and religion teach self-sacrifice, but then they force women to do more sacrificing. Um, to see the future of the species has been the privilege of the intellectual elite. So there is a reason to give some people the leisure time to think, as long as they don't abuse it. Uh, if they really try to educate the public, educate people, to move the society forward in a way that's attainable, that's important, that you can't go back and you can't go sideways, you've got to go forward. And to be able to articulate that in a way that's not threatening and that actually guides the process and gives people 
concepts, ideas from which they start creating organizations, they start changing their lives, and they work, you know, at all the other levels. So first you have to have the vision, then you start to break it down into different aspects of that. And, and um, different people have different orientations. Okay, Marzia, what do you think? Uh, professor, I have a question. My question is that, do you think religion is kind with women or unkind? It varies, right? I, it's important to me that each student works that out for themselves because um, each student at AUW has a different experience. And, you know, the stereotype right now is that women is, uh, religion is backward looking because the news is always about that, right? Um, the Taliban, for example. But um, I, you know, that's what Nussbaum and Wollstonecraft, they, they say that it isn't necessary. I mean, personally, well, I can tell you personally, my dad was a preacher, okay? And he was, our church was the most progressive institution in the whole town. Um, he marched with Martin Luther King. He wanted women's equality, he wanted environmental protection, he wanted civil rights, he was against the Vietnam War, he wanted interfaith dialogue. I mean, I mean, my dad was right up there in the public, forward looking. But when I came to to Arkansas, I realized most people in Arkansas don't think like that and they don't unite reason and faith. And that was a shock to me. So I re it's very important to me that each student works out in her mind and in her soul because it means a lot to her, right? It's a risk uh, to give up your religion. It might, I mean, each student has to work it out in their own way is a really important view that I have. Does that make sense, Marzia? Uh, yes, Professor. But I think like someone used the, the religion, the name of religion. And also the problem is that most of the women accept the, that the situations that others define for themselves, why they accept and like it's it's for me unimaginable. Actually, I'm going to put you in breakout groups because I love to talk about this stuff, but I think you need to get in smaller groups so everybody can talk. Um, and what is it? Here's the big issue, though. The, you're going to be the educated women. How do you tell women they're brainwashed? <laughs> I mean, you, you can't, you know, you're not. I mean, it's very complicated. And there isn't any one answer to that question. Like your whole life, you'll be sort of making judgment calls about that in a whole lot of different ways. Um, but just, you know, just be aware that you're going to be constantly in situations where it, it'll be a different call um, for this person or on this issue. Anyway, so I'm going to put you back in groups and let you talk, talk, talk about it, okay? Um, uh, Kala? Yes, Professor. Okay. Professor, in my opinion, I think that religion is the most important point for a woman issue. Because in my country, I can't travel alone, so I faced many obstacles. So I must to travel with a male. It's called mahram in Islam. Right. So, so that's what I find it logical. Talk. Right. Yeah. You should talk about that in groups, but I really, I have some AUW students and you can tell that, that they have a whole, a huge long argument for why Muhammad would want equality for women. And so I, I just stay out of it. <laughs> uh, there's a difference between the religion and then the way it's practiced and in, it's institutionalized and that, Jesus treated women as equals, but that doesn't mean Christians do. <laughs> right? Yes. Yeah, it's a, it's a problem. I teach that in one of my other classes. Um, 
So anyway, thanks for saying something, but go ahead in your small group, have a good discussion about it. It's really, it touches all of you deeply, but you don't wanna fight against each other over it. So the next section of the class is about organizations that are focused on women's education. Okay, raise your hand if, you've, if you looked one up and found one. Um, that was part of the assignment, so. Okay, Mahira, go ahead. Oh, good, good. If everybody raises their hand, I'll put you back in groups. But um, go ahead, raise your hand if you did find one, and then I'll have some idea, because I don't want to run out of time. Uh, Mahira, go ahead. Uh, Mama, I found an organization that supports women education. It's called Bangladesh Women Foundation, which supports rural, rural women's education. And also, uh, besides education, they also support uh, uh, necessary things for them. Okay, do you know of it? Have you ever heard of it before? Now, there are uh, many actually like this organization which supports women, uh, which are basically all the, quite similar uh, for, for education, for entrepreneurship, for shelter, food, and necessary teachings, trainings, like that. Okay, uh, Brock, you know, Brock is huge. I think it's the number one in the world, and it does focus on women. So Bangladesh has a good reputation. I think that's why um, Kamal made the proposal for the AUW. And that was why the donors agreed because uh, the country has this long established um, tradition of knowing how to start with women and develop micro kind of micro lending. So that, um, did I send you from the Berkeley Center? There was this video about women's uh, education. Anyway, I'll, send it again or I'll cut and paste it and put it in that post that has all the other ones in it. Um, Melanie, what have you got? Um, my organization was the National Women's History Museum and they basically, it's a museum that educates, inspires and empowers um, women and it provides kind of, it shapes the future and provides a background of the complete view of women in American history. And all of the proceeds um, that they make benefit the Fund for Women's Equality and Education. Is that in Washington, DC? Um, I'm not sure, but I can look it up right now. Okay. Uh, there's an art, you know, women's art. But I mean, when you're in the presence of, you know, something about women's history, it's so amazing because it is so different. And like these women were still living and they were doing stuff and they're just completely silenced. They're just invisible. So uh, again, in your lifetime, the rest of you, every one of your countries is gonna have a lot more women's history partly dug up by women scholars and partly you're literally making it. But, you know, women were always alive and well and doing things. It just never got recorded. And that just gives you such a distorted view of human history, right? Okay, Rosani, what did you have? Um, professor, uh, even I had that uh, name, like NGO name in my mind, and it's like uh, Education for Empowerment, E for E in Nepal. And I was one of the child who was a sponsor for education since primary school. So I was closely <laughs> related to that. I'm closely connected with it. So that I had been observing since my childhood. And um, yeah, that's uh, something, when I, whenever I say this name, I feel so proud because I am one of the daughter from that organization and that has been helping um, many thousands of girls, I guess. Um, uh, and that's like US best support uh, organization. Uh, and uh, yeah, Professor, that's it. It's like it, before initially it was uh, named as underprivileged girls education support program, but then later on it got, it changed its name and uh, um, it's now called as education for empowerment. E for yes, that's a much better word. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, yes, 
Yeah, well, someday you might want to give back or you might want to continue that tradition, but you don't have to. Um, somebody else might think that's their calling, you know, to actually keep. Yes, that. Professor. You okay. know, yeah, whoever our sponsor, most of the what we uh, what tradition we have there is like um, we were uh, sponsored, like we uh, our education was sponsored by them, right? So now, what most of the girls have done is like whoever are graduated or whoever is working in any of the field, they at least sponsor one child or give some yeah. money to. Okay. Uh, to, to that organization so that they can educate the other girl. It's like giving back to them. Yeah. So there's yeah. this trend in this organization and which is, I think it's very good that uh, it's like education is not wasted. One, if one gets educated, then that person will educate the other one. Right, AUW is a really recent school, but a lot of alums already help their sisters, you know, help open doors and give back. Um, so there's just a lot of potential there for AUW to just keep developing that history. Uh, Nizali, what about you? Oh, yes, ma'am. Uh, when I searched for the such organizations, I found a number of organizations which uh, was uh, took place after the wartime, but most of them aren't uh, continue till today, but I would like to share some a thing about the Women's Education and Research Center in Sri Lanka. Uh, it is an independent and non-government uh, feminist organization, uh, it, and uh, it is uh, it was founded by a small group of uh, feminist researchers and activists, um, and their uh, main uh, goal is to highlight the status of women in the country and uh, publish materials um, which can be used uh, by women in uh, their struggles uh, for. Uh, for liberation and uh, the they they work to increase women's awareness uh, their resources and opportunities uh, for an uh, effective participation in the economic and uh, in both economic political and especially the social life uh, of the country okay good um koala yes professor did you have one? Yes. Uh, my one is United Nations Women's Authority. Okay. It is to support women in Yemen who can lead to the changes mm -hmm. that help to see in their country, including economic hesitations. And the beginning of the work, this work is the experience of Yemeni women at the work, at the role in space processes. The current world while in the United Nations and women's effort in founded in partnership with the governments of the United Kingdom, as well as the United Nations Peace Building Support Office, and also its support the gender equality. Okay, good. Um, and then who's the last one, Delana? Oh, did she do? Yeah, professor, uh, I want to say uh, about the foundation in Bangladesh, which is BRAC, and uh, it's really a good worldwide organization which is work for the women's education, health, uh, and uh, like women's uh, empowerment in um, uh, in uh, their society and uh, women's role in their society, and also. Uh, it uh, works uh, against the child marriage and uh, a lots of things. So I think uh, like uh, uh, they also try to remove the poverty from our uh, like uh, society and which is a, which has a bad effect uh, on in women's life. Uh, so uh, it's a good example for me like for right so if any of you want to do more research on bra for your research paper that would be great and um professor naomi uh worked there for 10 years so she could give you some she gave me some articles to read because when i moved there for a while i did a paper on um the leader of it comparing him to an aristotelian wise man but um 
anyway, so if you want to do that, and you know, it's the kind of thing where you just don't find the time to spend to write a paper. And so this would be a chance to do that and get some credit for it. Um, let's see, Marzia, have I called on you already or not? I can't remember whose hand. Um, no, Professor. Okay. About the, uh, the organization. Uh, there is an organization, WOW Women for, uh, WAW Women for Afghan Women. Uh, uh, this organization is uh, is uh, one of the one of the largest non-government Afghan women's rights organizations. Uh, it was uh, like uh, it works for the uh, for educational. It it takes conduct some educational workshop about women's rights and also about women's educational uh, opportunities. For example provide for uh, Afghan girls uh, to follow their education in some American universities, scholarship. So uh, can I uh, take this organization? You want to do research on it? Uh, if it's possible. Sure. Why don't you see? I mean, you can see what's happening with the Taliban. If they, if the women who run it have left the country or if yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's going to be hard to get information. I have three more. And so just one minute each or something. Sauda, Mahira, and Fayaza. Go ahead. So I'll do Mahira here. Sauda seems to be lost contact. Ma'am, I was asking about the research paper that uh, can, can I include uh, two organizations in that research paper? Of course. Paper? Yeah, anything that interests you, it interests me. <laughs> so. Also, uh, also uh, with, when you will give the research paper, you will give a certain amount of time to finish that, right? Because uh, within well, that time- Go ahead and look on the syllabus for the due date, right? Uh, I know. Uh, with, I was asking that within that due date, will you give any new materials? Because uh, we need to write on it, right? Right. I mean, that you can look at the other, what we're going to read. We're just reading different goddesses and things. But um, you just, you know, you don't have to wait. You can start it now if you have an interest. Um, that's the main thing and just plan ahead and start it early enough so that you can get it done. Um, um, within that uh, week, will we have any other reflections? Um, you just have to do 10 over the semester. And so you make a judgment call about which ones you want to hand in. Does that make sense? Oh, that means we have to work together, the research paper also, the reflection also. Well, I mean, if you don't do a reflection that week, yeah, you don't do the reflection in the research paper because the research paper is a separate paper. Um, but you, and, you know, it's just a question whether you want to post something that week in addition to the pa research paper or not. And that's all up to you because you gauge, you pace yourself so that by final week, you have 10 posts in and you have your papers in. Um, I'm going to have to let you go. So people who have another class can go and I'll stay and I'll answer questions. And I also am curious to know what other organizations and I'll leave the recording on so that the students listening to the YouTube can hear about these things. Okay. okay, Professor, so bye-bye. I am so glad to have a student from Yemen. I mean, these countries, it's so amazing. I mean, all I do is read about this and I just to be able to have some contact is so amazing. So yeah. hang in there. Maybe one day you can come to Yemen. It's Maybe. very beautiful. <laughs> they, yeah, they want an American woman, I'm sure. <laughs> But yeah. uh, you never know. You never know. I, I've been to places I never thought I would be, China and Russia. So you don't know. Okay, Fayaza, what you got? Uh, professor, I have to... Uh, sorry, I was a bit sick. That's why I can't speak louder. Can you hear me? Uh, barely. I can hear you. 
thank you uh, i have to uh, i i was work with uh, wdf it's called women development foundation um, like uh, when i was work with them uh, they usually uh, work with most of the uh, very underground like uh, the poor women and all the very community level they the based on work with women so they have the priority for women uh, on that uh, values uh, they are encouraging women to study and for for me the personally they they are the one like uh, who uh, told me push me to apply to the asian university for men also like um, they are helping to apply and they are founding uh, like they are giving so many scholarship to the girls and all um, they are giving the evening classes as well right. so i i think uh, i'm going to research about them like right you can research like the origin of it you can research how it's organized you can research if you think it's efficiently organized you might be able to make recommendations or you might actually figure out why it's well organized i mean just refining you know people constantly refining their organizations and making them work better so a research paper doesn't necessarily just have to describe stuff it can make suggestions or you can learn about what a well organized organization is for a future reference so i think it'd be great it's a really so, good so idea uh, yeah professor so i have the uh, two organizations so i will choose one is that okay sure you can do both if you want there's no okay. minimum but okay. if you want to go deeper into something that's okay. fine thank you professor okay marzia uh professor i wanted to say that right now there is not any organization active for women so what should i do about my you don't have to do your country then i mean you could do an international ngo okay okay you could, then you could do one that has worked in afghanistan in the past and you could okay. maybe try to find out what's going on right now um okay. yeah mostly marzia you know you're looking to the future right and so just doing research about what worked in the past or just in general what sort of organizational structure do the do women's empowerment organizations have and how are they refining their uh, structure and do certain countries for example if you have a country that's really conservative like afghanistan it would make sense that you would have women in things like education childhood education because you don't want men teachers right so how is it that certain or nursing like healthcare they don't want men taking care of women right or pregnancy or whatever so you could just think about how um a women's organization would be structured in a way that tries to be the most effective in your country or you know just use your imagination for the kinds of stuff that you'd like to learn because they can give you a tool for your future okay professor okay um soda uh yes professor i found an organization uh it's bangladesh women foundation uh which is representation of the efforts of rural women's organization working through Bangladesh. In generally uh, hostile condition, women try to promote gender equality, uh, women's leadership, women's human right, and combating of uh, violence against women and children. Is it uh, okay? Yeah, the main- Can I use this? Right, you can. It's just don't keep it at that general level because there, there are hundreds of organizations, right, who have that mission statement. Like, describe how they boots on the ground, like how they actually face women and deal with women and get particular women from point A to point B. And also how they must be working with Brock in some way, or they must have used Brock as a model. 
you know, there's no way you can have Brock and then not have an organization in Bangladesh be affected by it. Um, and you could ask uh, Dr. Naomi if she knows about that too. She might have some good ideas. Uh, okay, okay, Professor, thank you. Sure. Um, Jacinta? Yes, Professor, uh, like uh, for the first uh, post assignment, uh, Goddess and uh, Ar Ar Aristic, I think. So uh, for that post, I didn't uh, submit the assignment. Uh, can I submit it now? Sure. Will you mark? Yeah, sure. Okay. I'll read them, I think, tomorrow. No, that's right. I just found out I'm going to babysit my grandkids tomorrow. So, but I'll get them read in a couple days. Okay, Professor, thank you. Sure. Uh, Breezy? Yes. Professor, I found an organization named uh, Empowering Underprivileged Women of Bangladesh. And their mo main goal is to create a different uh, lives for women uh, as they can, you know, uh, remove their social barriers uh, by giving them education. Okay, well, you can check it out. You can see when it was founded, who founded it. Um, yeah, I mean, you can also yes. see, do they have, do they, do they do art, right? How many women's organizations include, you know, art as part of the empowerment of women or the development of women or something? Yes, uh, I lost you. Also, a woman is the owner of this. What? 